passage to all of you here. Second Peter uh, chapter number one. And we're going to be looking at verses 19 through 21. Second Peter chapter one. And I'll read verses 19 through 21. Peter the apostle is saying we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Amen. A more sure word of prophecy. And he says in um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, we have also a more, and I'll circle this, sure word of prophecy. You can take that to the bank, amen? amen. We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. It's not of human origin. This book is the inspired, inerrant, authoritative word of the living God. Verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. See, there it is right there. It doesn't come from human origin. By the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let's pray this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity, Lord, to uh, be here at New England Baptist Church, and we're so thankful for the ministry of Central Baptist Church and Pastor Townsley, and uh, for what is being done here in this ministry, being a light uh, to the people of Southington and the surrounding areas, and preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, uh, it, I'm just uh, thrilled in my heart to see these, these young people here at this school, Lord, studying the word of God, preparing themselves for ministry, for the, for the plan, Lord, uh, that you have for uh, their very lives. You have a plan, Lord, for each and every one of us. And Heavenly Father, it is my prayer during this uh, time of uh, chapel service that you would use me, Lord, to uh, challenge uh, your people, Lord, to challenge myself, Lord, as we a rapidly racing toward the soon return of Jesus Christ. And we know that prophecy, Lord, uh, is a subject that is uh, sorely neglected in the church today. But we know that uh, Bible prophecy, the rapture, is our blessed hope. And so, Father, may you now be glorified in everything that is said and done here behind this pulpit. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said. So we see here, Peter the Apostle tells us we have a more sure word of prophecy, referring to the infallibility of the word of God. Why? This book that we hold in his hand, this King James Bible that we had, it is God's clearest revelation to man today. I want to say there are no modern day revelations today. Doesn't matter what they're saying on TV or on radio, there are no modern day revelations today. All the revelation that you and I need is what's contained in this book, amen? amen. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, that's all the prophecy that we need is right here in the word of God. So there are no modern day revelations today. And Bible prophecy covers at least one-fourth of scripture. That's why it is a more sure word of prophecy. It's something that we can rely on, amen? And it shows what's going to happen in the not-too-distant future. Since Russia invaded the Ukraine, my email's been blown up. I've been getting phone calls from pastors all over the country. Brother Rosado, is this a fulfillment of prophecy? No, it isn't. Because it's not the invasion of Israel. That's prophecy, that's Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. What we see going on in Ukraine may be a precursor to what is to come, amen? And I got to tell you this, one of the most abused doctrines in the church today is the doctrine of Bible prophecy. It's abused, it's misused, misinterpreted, making a mountain out of a molehill. And all my 33 years of studying Bible prophecy, I said, Lord, I never, ever want to mislead anyone, uh, misinterpret the scriptures. I want to teach Bible prophecy responsibly. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to do here today to you students. Teach Bible prophecy responsibly to you. Bible prophecy motivates us to what? Live holy, right? To live righteously. It motivates you and I to draw closer to God. Every day knowing that Jesus could come at any moment. But it should also 
motivate us to win souls to Jesus Christ in these last days in which we live. And I'm reminded of what uh, Paul the Apostle said in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. He says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Then he says in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Nowhere in the New Testament does it tell Brother August Rosado or you, for that matter, to look for the Antichrist or to look for the beast. We've got too many people looking for the Antichrist today. They're putting the cart before the horse. The Bible doesn't tell us to look for the Antichrist, but to look for Jesus Christ. Why? He is the promise of our blessed hope. Don't let anyone rob you of the promise of the blessed hope. That's why Jesus said in Revelation 2.25, but that which you have already, hold fast till I come. He said the same thing in Revelation 3.11, behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast that no man take your crown. Crowns of reward at the bema, the judgment seat of Christ. That's only for the believer, amen? Romans 14.10, Romans 14.12, 2 Corinthians 5.10, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 11 through 15. Bible prophecy motivates you and I to live holy, righteously, and godly in this present age. And for anyone to say that we should not study, teach, or preach, Bible prophecy is contradicting, I repeat, contradicting. The word of God, the word of Jesus, for that matter, in Revelation chapter one and verse number three, he said, blessed is he that readeth. That means you use your eye gate to get information. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear. hear. Use your ear gate, another source of getting information into the back of that cerebellum of yours. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written therein. Why? For the time is at hand. If John the Apostle could make that statement 2,000 years ago as a prisoner of the Roman Empire on the Isle of Patmos that the time is at hand because he thought Jesus would come during his time, 2,000 years later, 21st century AD, how close can we be to his soon return? You know, when I go to church this past Townsley, I like to toot my own horn. That's why I got this thing down here that I purchased in Israel in 2010. Can anyone tell me what this is? It's not a ram's horn. So far, so good, absolutely, yes. <laughs> it's a show, but this is a Yemenite shofar. It's a longer version of a shofar, but the ram's horn, that's a shofar, that's a biblical shofar out of Genesis chapter number 22. And I'm convinced that when we see that word trumpet in the Bible, it's referring to a shofar. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, a simple reading of Joshua chapter 6, verses 4, 5, 6, 8, 13. Tells us five times, the priest, the Kohen Haggadol, the priest blew the trumpet of ram's horns. Ram's horn in Hebrew is a shofar. So one day a shofar from heaven is going to sound. It's going to be so loud. The dead in Christ shall rise first. They got six feet further to go, but they go first. <laughs> but then we, which are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, the Bible says, comfort one another. Aren't those comforting words? To comfort one another with these words. Prophecy is 33% of the Bible. For example, if you take Daniel chapter one, all the way to Revelation chapter number 22, you are looking at at least 400 chapters of the 1189 chapters of scripture that deal with Bible prophecy. So if it's important to God, it should be just as important to us, amen? Do not neglect the study of a doctrine that permeates at least one-fourth of Scripture. Think about this with me. Of the Bible's 31,124 verses, 8,352 of those verses deal with predictions, dealing with future events. And Bible prophecy 
should be studied. Now listen to me. Studied for its plain sense interpretation. You know why? The Bible is its best own interpreter. It doesn't need the help of Brother August Rosado. It doesn't need the help of some other prophecy scholar out there. The Bible is its best own interpreter. Because if the plain sense makes sense, don't look for any other sense. Or you will end up with nonsense. And again, when it comes to Bible prophecy, there is a lot of nonsense out there in the world today because everybody wants to play the guessing game of oh, who is the Antichrist. Oh, Brother August, do you know who the Antichrist is? No, and I don't care. Because I'm not looking for him. I'm looking for my Savior. I'm looking for the promise of the blessed hope. Now, I know we have a job to do while we're here, amen? Redeem the time because the days are evil, Ephesians 5.16. And it blesses my heart to see you young people out there soul winning. Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people that you come into contact with. That is our mandate from the Lord to be soul winners, right? Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world and do what? Yeah, preach the gospel to every creature. Again, a whosoever salvation, amen? Salvation is sufficient for all, but efficient for those who call upon the name of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. That is our mandate. That is our job given from our commander-in-chief. Amen? Not the guy in the White House. I'm talking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, above. Amen. He commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why? We don't know how much time we have left. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't know how much time we have left. The church age could end this morning. That trumpet could sound this morning. And when it does, we're taken out of here. And anyone left behind at the rapture, you're in serious trouble. You know why? Anyone left behind will go through a devastating period, unprecedented. The 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, a.k.a. a seven-year period of tribulation. And during that seven-year period of tribulation, God is going to pour out 21 judgments on this earth. Seven seals, Revelation chapter 6. Seven trumpets, Revelation 8-2. Revelation chapter 9, seven vials, seven bowl judgments, Revelation chapter 15, Revelation chapter 16. All seven years is the wrath of God. And you and I as a church will have no part of this whatsoever. That's the reason why Paul the Apostle said in verse 18, comfort one another with these words. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 1, let not your heart be Troubled. We live in a troubled world. We know that. That's obvious. But he said, let not your heart be troubled. Why? He's going to take us out of here. Yeah. When that trumpet sounds, we're gone. We're out. The dead in Christ rise out of those graves. Those of us alive at the time of the rapture are taken out of here. Someone says, well, what if you die before the rapture, Brother August? Well, that's out of my hands, man. I have no control over that. That's in God's hands. But if I die before the rapture, I've already instructed my wife to do this. I want this on my headstone. Here lies Brother August Rosado. Only rent in this spot. We'll be leaving soon. Amen? The dead in Christ will rise first. But if I'm alive at the time of the rapture, that works too. Amen? Because I'm, really, I'm not looking for the undertaker, but I am looking for the upper taker. I'm looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not looking for the beast. I'm looking for the Son of God. I'm looking for the coming of our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. The Bible is its best own interpreter, interpreter, and we must apply a proper biblical hermeneutic. You're in Bible college. You're going to take a course on hermeneutics if you haven't already. Hermeneutics is the science of biblical interpretation. Who's speaking? Who's he speaking to? What is he speaking about? Hermeneutics, the science of biblical interpretation. Looking at the word of God for its Grammatical, historical, contextual, and very important, literal interpretation. Well, August, I read the book of Daniel, all this symbolism. Oh, I read the book of Revelation. Wow, all this symbolism. Yeah, there's a lot of symbolism. But you must look for a literal interpretation behind the symbolism. 
And do you know who's going to interpret the symbolism? Not me. Exactly, this book. This book will interpret the symbolism for you. The problem that we have today with a lot of prophecy teachers is that they take the symbolism and then they try to interpret these symbols in their own finite thinking and then they get into doctrinal trouble. Why? They are not applying proper biblical hermeneutics, the science of biblical interpretation. You must also apply inductive Bible study. That just simply means you compare scripture with scripture in order to ascertain more information about a person, a place, an event. Again, the Bible stands on its own. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture, amen? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's a Greek word, theos, neustos. God breathe. Every jot and tittle of this book is God breathed. And you can take it to the bank. You know why? God's checks don't bounce. Yes, God. Inspired, inerrant, authoritative word of the living God. And I take this book literally. And if I run into the symbolism, the Bible will tell me so and interpret the symbolism for me so that I can come to the correct conclusion. Compare scripture with scripture. Inductive Bible study. It's a beautiful, rich approach to studying the word of God, but especially Bible prophecy. We have three main events in Bible prophecy. You might want to write these down. The three main events of Bible prophecy. The first one, the rapture of the church. And let me just be clear here. As a fundamental Baptist preacher, I'm convinced of a pre-tribulation rapture. Amen. Pre means what? Before. So the church will be taken out before the events of the 70th week, before the events of that future seven-year period of tribulation to come. So the three main events are the rapture. Following the rapture, using alliteration here, return. The return, that will be the second coming of Jesus Christ back, <clears throat> excuse me, back to this earth. The seven-year period of tribulation separates the rapture from the return. And then the retribution. What's the retribution? The great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20, 11 through 15 describes the great white throne judgment. That's for the unbeliever, not the believer. Amen? For the believer, there's the bema, the judgment seat of Christ. But for the unbeliever, that's the retribution. That is the great white throne judgment. So we have rapture, return, and retribution. And again, I'm convinced of a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. The retribution of the great white throne happens at the end of the millennial kingdom. Can someone tell me how long that millennial kingdom is for? Now, how do we know it's a thousand years? The Bible tells me so Six times to be exact. Revelation chapter 20, 2 through 7 tells us six times he will reign for a thousand years. From a city I have been to 27 times. The holy city of Jerusalem. One little, little Hebrew. I want everyone to say Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim. Isn't that a beautiful Hebrew word? Yerushalayim. Jerusalem. He's going to reign from that very city for 1,000 years. In all my 27 trips to the Holy Land, I see these little Jewish boys and girls singing in the streets. And they sing a song that I love to hear when I'm in Israel. It's called Jerusalem, City of Gold. Yerushalayim shazahav v'shelecho or haloli kol shi'arik ani kinor. Jerusalem, the city of gold. Let me be a violin unto all your songs. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 35, Jerusalem, the city of the great king. Because one day the king of kings and the Lord of lords will reign from that very city. When I look at the millennial kingdom, that is a literal, physical, bodily reign of Jesus Christ from a physical, literal city. The holy city of Jerusalem. And those of us that know him as Lord and personal Savior, we're going to reign with him in that city for 1,000 years. So I'm here to tell you this morning, for 1,000 years, you're all 
going to be Israelis. Because you're going to reign with the greatest Jew, the greatest rabbi, the greatest Israeli to ever walk the face of this earth. And yeah, I'm going to speak in a little tongues this morning. Yeshua, Hamashiach, Ben David, Ben Abraham. But at least I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Hebrew, Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, will one day reign from that very city. Then we have three main books of Bible prophecy. We have Ezekiel, Ezekiel, God's program for Israel. Ezekiel, God's program for Israel. Then we have the book of Daniel, God's program for the Gentiles, his program for the Gentiles. And then Revelation, God's program for the church. And what is a program for the church? Taken out of here. Revelation 4, 2, come up, hither. And then a reading of Revelation chapters 4 and 5, we're around the throne of God, amen. There are four living creatures in front of the throne of God, mentioned in Ezekiel chapter number 10. And then John talks about the term four and 20 elders. I believe that's a reference to the raptured church. And you'll find that multiple times in the book of Revelation. And the scene is always in heaven. The 4 and 20 elders. Revelation 4, 4, 4, 10, 5, 8, 5, 14, 7, 11, 11, 16, 14, 3, 19, 3. The 4 and 20 elders. Us, the redeemed, raptured church in heaven. Then John said, I saw angels. Now Daniel 7, 10 tells us 10,000 times 10,000. But doesn't tell us who the 10,000 times 10,000 are. So I apply inductive Bible study. I go to Revelation 5.11. John said, I saw angels 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands around the throne of God. You do the math on that. 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million plus angels. Woo! That's a lot of angels, amen? And we are all around the throne of God. And we are praising him up there in heaven sometime after the rapture of the church. Then we have the three strands of the human family according to Bible prophecy. Gentiles. God's program for the Gentiles. Genesis chapters 1 through 11. Then the second strand of the human family. Jews. Genesis 12 to Acts chapter 1. God's program for the Jewish people. And then his program for the church. Acts chapter 2. Pentecost. Up until the rapture of the church, Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 2. That is how God divides humanity today. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 10, 32? Give none offense to the Jew, Gentile, church of God. That is how God divides humanity today. Jew, Gentile, church of God. Unbelieving Jew, unbelieving Gentile, born again Jews and Gentiles that make up what? the church, the body of Christ. God has a program for all three strands of the human race. The three main passages that deal with the rapture, write these down, John 14, 1 through 3. I love John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. My King James says mansions. I love that, mansions. If one not, so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I love these four words, I will come again. Amen. Amen. And receive unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Second rapture passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52. Everybody loves a good mystery. Here's one right here. Paul said, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the... Twink, live an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. Gotta love that. Third rapture passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Those are the three main rapture passages right there. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And Paul is telling the church, don't be ignorant concerning the coming of the Lord. He said, for I will not have to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, 
that you saw will not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. And he says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shell. With the voice of the archangel, trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Three main rapture passages. And as I said already, I'm convinced that the rapture will happen before that seven-year period of tribulation. It, it just boggles my mind that there are many that are trying to put us on the earth in the tribulation period. And in all my 33 years of studying Bible prophecy, and I've studied all those other positions, I'm talking mid-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath. I mean, I've studied them all. I am just not convinced. I am convinced of a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Write this verse down, Romans 5.9. Paul said much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Sounds pre-tribby to me. Write this one down. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us future tense from the wrath to come. Sounds pre-tribby. What about 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9? For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Sounds pre tribby What about the words of Jesus? Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from. Ek in the Greek, E-K, keep thee from. Keep us out of the time of of temptation to come upon all the world to try, and we're not even included in this term, to try them. Not you, them. Who's them? The unregenerate, the unbelievers, unbelieving Jew, unbelieving Gentile, to try them who dwell on the earth. Why? Because it's a time of whose trouble? Who's Jacob? Genesis 32, 28, Israel. It's a time of Israel's trouble. Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks or a final seven-year period are determined upon thy people. Who's he talking about, thy people? Christians? Jews? He's talking to the Jews. How do I know that? Thy people and thy holy city. What city is it? Yerushalayim, the holy city of Jerusalem. The purpose of the tribulation period is to bring unbelieving Israel to faith in Jesus as their Savior, Messiah. Believe me when I tell you this, when I go soul one in Israel, Israel is in a state of unbelief. They still reject Jesus as the Messiah. They don't believe in the New Testament whatsoever. And to them, we Christians have got it all wrong. But when I challenge them, not even using the New Testament, but when I challenge them using the Old Testament and all the Messianic prophecies, they don't know how to answer me. I, when I use Isaiah 53, who's that talking about? Well, that's talking about the sufferings of the nation of Israel. No, because of the personal pronouns in Isaiah 53. He's talking about one person dying for the sins of all. And if this was talking about Israel, how can Israel die for the sins of Israel? And then they look at you like a deer in a headlamp. They don't know how to answer that. Because the rabbis always tell their people, two passages you don't deal with. You don't deal with Isaiah 53, and you don't deal with Daniel 9, 24 through 27, the 70 weeks of prophecy. Because the 70 weeks of prophecy gives us a timeline for the coming of the Messiah and for the death of the Messiah. And they won't touch that with a 10-foot Paul. So we, we use all these messianic prophecies when we're out there in Israel sharing the gospel with them. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. It's all about the nation of Israel to bring them the faith to Jesus Christ as their Savior and Messiah. And unfortunately, they got to go through a seven-year period of tribulation to do exactly that, as well as the unbelieving Gentile nations of the world. So it's a time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble, Jacob's trouble. Amen? This has nothing to do with the church at all. 
And if you ever run into any of these other guys that uh, say, well, no, I think we're going to go through the tribulation period. Use the book of Revelation as a prime example that we will not be here. And this is what you tell them. The church is mentioned 25 times in the book of Revelation. The church is mentioned 19 times before Revelation 4 2. This is way before the tribulation period begins. 19 times before Revelation 4 2. And then the church is mentioned another six times after Revelation 19 11. This is after the tribulation period. In between those 15 chapters, 4 through 19, that cover the seven year period of tribulation, the church is not mentioned as being on the earth at all. Either God forgot to put us there, or we're just not there. <laughs> right? just, how do I come to that conclusion? A plain sense interpretation of scripture. Again, if the plain sense makes sense, don't look for any other sense. <laughs> You're going to end up with nonsense. You've got to avoid that YouTube eschatology out there, okay? <laughs> but what is eschatology? It's a fancy word. I know you learned this in school here. It's a fancy word that simply means the doctrine of last things. The doctrine of the end times. But let me just differentiate here with the little time we have left. We're not in the end times right now. <sighs> did I just hear you, Brother Rosado? Yeah, you did. We're in the last days. The last days of the church age that began at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, will end at the rapture of the church. We are in the last days right now. Don't believe me? Read 2 Timothy 3. 1 through 5. It's like reading the front page of a local newspaper for crying out loud. This Bible is an up-to-date book. Paul said this, know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. I think we're living in those perilous times right now. How about you? Then he gives me 19 characteristics. I've counted. I've circled 19 characteristics. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, man, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such. Turn away. We're in the last days. When the church age ends at the rapture, we're taken out of here, then down the road, the end times will commence with a seven year period of tribulation. That will be the beginning of the end times. And the church will not be here, amen? Why? Jesus said, I will take you out, ek, ek, I will take you from that hour of temptation. Then when we're in heaven, at the rapture, we're gonna be in heaven for just a brief seven years. <laughs> While the earth below is going through what? Seven year period of tribulation. And in heaven for those seven years, we have a date with the king of the Jews. The judgment seat of Christ. I told you already, Romans 14, 10, Romans 14, 12, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. And when that's all said and done, there's going to be a beautiful Jewish wedding. I've been to those Jewish weddings in Israel, man. And you know something? The, the bride and the groom are in that honeymoon chamber for seven days before they come out and have the wedding feast with their family. Seven days. That corresponds to the Jewish wedding customs of John 14, 1 through 3. Then after that wedding, there's going to be a wedding feast. That's Revelation 19, 7, 8, 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And then when we have our fill of whatever he's going to feed us with up there, we're going to get back on white horses. Coming back where? Terra firma. Planet Earth. To what city? Jerusalem. That's Revelation 19, 11 through 16. John said, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true. In righteousness doth he judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And upon his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the word of God. Here's your cue. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. 
upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. What army am I talking about? The army that was raptured seven years earlier, coming back with him seven years later. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that whether he should smite the nations, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress in the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And upon his vesture and upon his thigh was a name written, King of Kings. Woo! And Lord of Lords. I'll tell you, it doesn't get any better than that. Amen. I'm going to have to stop right here. What did Jesus say? When you see prophecy unfolding in its early stages, you better start looking up. I'm about to call my bride out of the world. He said in Luke 21, 28, when you see these things begin, not fulfilled, begin to come to pass. Look up. Lift up your heads for your redemption. Draweth nigh. What redemption? The next main event on God's calendar of activities. The rapture of the church. Let's get busy for the Lord. Winning souls. Studying his word. Being faithful to the house of God. Fellowshipping with one another. Study, right? 2 Timothy 2.15. That's why you're here. Study. To show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's get busy, serve the Lord, until one day we hear. Come up, Heather! And faster than you can blink your eye, boom, we're out of here. You know something? I never was an astronaut, but one day I'm going to be a was not. <laughs> Jesus is coming soon, sooner than we think. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you need to get to know him today. And if you do know him as personal Savior, share him with the lost. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to, to be here at New England Baptist College. And thank you for the ministry of Central Baptist Church, Lord. What a blessing. It is to be here, Lord, uh, to be asked to come to talk to these students, the faculty here, and I'm, I'm honored, I'm, I'm humbled, and I'm blessed. They could have found a better man, Lord, but I'm, I'm, I'm humbled that they asked me to come. And I'm asking you, dear Lord, that everything that was said here this morning would resonate with each and every one of us, Lord, that as we draw closer to the soon return of the Lord, that we would live holy, righteously, and godly in this present world. The church age about to come to an end, and it could even be today, Lord. Help us to keep looking up, knowing that our redemption draweth nigh. Father, thank you for what you're about to do today. Continue to help us to be astute students of the word of God and Bible prophecy. Pray now, Heavenly Father, that your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen, amen. Thank you so much. Pastor Townsley, thank you. Appreciate that. Let's stand together.